Uh, good morning, book sniffers, and a very warm welcome back to the library is open. So I hope you brought your library card, all you denizens of Biblioteca Town. I sounded a lot better in my head. <laughs> How are you, everyone? Uh, welcome to March. I guess spring has sprung. Not officially, because I know there are specific dates for things like that, but I always sort of segment the year into, like, December, January, February is winter, March, April, May is spring, and... Well, that, that may not be official. I don't care, no. Um, there is something about the fact that this time last year, um, it doesn't feel like a year, I guess, since the last March, which obviously was the kind of kickstart, really, of the whole pandemic as a global experience, um, you know, and it's a bit mad, isn't it, that it's come around again, but the sun is shining, weather is sweet. I'll get demonetised for that. Not that I'm monetized anyway. Um, but, you know, the, there is a spring in the air, as as it were, and um, that's, you know, I always find that helpful. It makes me feel a little bit better. So I hope that's had the same effect for you. So this week on the library, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some books centering around a similar theme. Um, I am noticing a lot, I think I said it in the comments last week, that I'm finding um, it, a little bit difficult to keep my attention focused on reading at the moment which could be a, a you know a response to this sort of the, the long-term you know effects of lockdown and so on and so forth but also the increased workload of working online I'm sorry if I'm in shadow here by the way um, but I kind of like it in a Phantom of the Opera style way um, so yeah I've, I have found because of that that my reading tastes have tended to be quite similar or thematic um, and this, this week has proved no exception. Um, so this week, or over the last week or so, I've been reading a lot of uh, memoir um, and, you know, sort of personal experience. Um, autobiography and biography, I'll make that clear in a moment. Um, and so I thought, well, let's just make a video about, about that and, and talk about those. Um, so the first, the first thing I wanted to read was, and this showed up in my most anticipated books, and I've almost been a little bit scared to read it because of the kind of, I don't know, the emotional connotations, I guess, or I, it was just me wanting to make sure that I was in the right kind of place to, to receive it, as it were. But with it just having been LGBTQ plus History Month, as I made a video on last week, Go check that out if you haven't. Um, there is the, a kind of thematic link there as well. And of course, Russell T. Davis's It's Sin has just been on telly, which has caused a lot of conversation. If you haven't seen that, I would recommend. I think it's an important piece of TV, irrespective of whether you like it or not. It's, it's one of those sort of TV landmarks that we should probably all have an awareness of. Uh, so this book is called All the Young Men. How One Woman Risked It All to Care for the Dying, and it's by Ruth Coker Burks. Now, this is a memoir with, um, she collaborated with Kevin Carr O'Leary, who's a sort of, I think he was acting as a ghostwriter or anything, but I think he sort of helped her with um, assembling the book, which is actually quite common practice, uh, where experienced authors will be placed with someone who actually has the experience, but maybe not the uh, knowledge or... Uh, desire to sit down and, and work out how to put that in book form um, and I mean that in no disrespect to to the author so this is a story about uh, one woman Ruth herself and how she in the town of Hot Springs it's a very sort of small uh, community in America how she basically took on the prejudice fear and ignorance surrounding the AIDS epidemic in um, in the US um, and it all begins almost quite innocuously where she's at the hospital to visit a friend and she sees a room where a gentleman um, who has uh, HIV um, is basically being shunned by the other nurses. They're drawing lots to see who has to go in to, to minister to him. Um, you know, because there was a lot of fear at the time, as I'm sure we're all, we're all aware, um, fear mongering and also a lot of um, misinformation about how um, the virus could be contracted. You know, people thought genuinely that you could get it from sharing cups or using the bathroom after someone or breathing the same air, so on and so forth. So it was like people were dealing with them in, um, with patients in, in like hazmat suits and at like six feet distance and so on and so forth. Um, but Ruth was sort of 
her, her humanity wouldn't allow her to see that happen without intervening. So she had no background in healthcare or medicine or anything like that, but she was just a humanitarian who really wanted to help and give people the dignity they deserved. And thus, uh, after helping one patient, she even buries the, the patients after their cremation when hardly any funeral services want to even be associated with the bodies. She, she gives them funeral rites, basically. Um, and this is also a chronicle about her life as well and uh, her daughter and her experiences with her husband's family and a town and also a country, if not a world, that was full of prejudice. And, you know, I didn't cry per se, but I was very moved uh, by a lot of just the simple acts of humanity and caring for others um, and, and placing the needs of someone else over your own. The, the, the most moving parts are when she describes the relationships she built with these men, particularly uh, in the sort of small uh, drag community in, in the area, one in particular, Billy, um, and, and she sort of chronicles long term his diagnosis and uh, the way he fought back against the disease and then his eventual unfortunate death. That's not a spoiler, that's made plain up front. Uh, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful humbling story of somebody who dared to say no this is not right um and that these people deserve to be treated with decency love and respect there's almost too much because it's such a vast chronicle of um the epidemic as it emerged so in in, in point of fact it's actually a historical document as well as it is a personal memoir and absolutely fascinating for anybody who's interested in how uh, viruses, disease, but also prejudice implicit in that is dealt with on a national and global level, and it just you just emerge with this absolute pure respect for Ruth and what she was up against. Um, it can't have been easy, but then sometimes doing the right thing isn't. So this was beautiful, and I completely recommend it. It's gorgeous. Um, the second book that I read is quite a slim volume. Um, I've noticed this a lot with translations. This is translated from the French. I'm wondering if there is like a strain in French literature where um, uh, it's quite sparse in terms of prose. That's not a critique because I actually really liked it and I think it worked really well to, to sort of hammer on, hammer on the points that were under discussion. I remember reading a few translations. One, uh, Lie With Me by Philip. Philippe Besson, I think, I think it was translated by Molly Ringwald, and that was also quite sparse and spare. And there's also Edouard Louis, who wrote um, The End of Eddie and The History of Violence and Who Killed My Father, and they're also quite sparse, so I'm wondering if that's like a stylistic thing. Just as a point of interest. Uh, but yeah, this is translated from the French, and it's originally by Vanessa Springora. It's a true story, and it's called Consent, and it chronicles her relationship. I was going to say affair then, but that implies consent or so on and so forth uh, her relationship or rather her dealings with a, a very famous French author who is referred to only as G and uh, she becomes involved with him as an underage uh, teenager and is given the kind of blessing by the literati and also by her family who are um, have their own issues going on in the background and it sort of details in a similar way to how um, My Dark Vanessa did in a, a fictional way um, how their relationship progressed and how she moved from recognising that their relationship was not one of equals whereby she could give informed valid consent but it actually was um, abuse by this author who are still not being brought to justice. Um, it's fascinating um, again historical document in terms of how what we would now term like paedophilia or um, you know preying on young people was kind of almost accepted um, as as a theoretical or uh, you know concept um, by intellectuals um, and artists and um, she actually writes in the back of the postscript between the lines, and sometimes in the most direct and crude way, some of GM's, that's the author's initials, books constitute an explicit apology for child sexual abuse. Literature considers itself to be above moral judgment, but it is our responsibility as publishers to keep in mind that a sexual relationship between an adult and a minor is a culpable act, punishable by law. 
See, it can't be that hard if even I can write those words. So this is a memoir not only about relationships, consent and a sort of young girl's coming of age um, under very um, inauspicious and also, you know, highly charged abusive circumstances, but also about the world of books and art more generally in terms of what is permissive and permissible. Now, as an artist, you know, um, that's not me sort of saying you know anything negative about the art community per se in terms of permissiveness because sometimes we need that level of permissiveness but it's about where do we draw the line in that where is it art where is it acceptable to cross those boundaries particularly when people are involved uh, she discovers a lot about um her um i don't know what to call him because he's not her partner and he's not her lover because again that implies consent but the man with whom she is involved um almost glories in his behaviours in a sort of I guess Lolita-esque way although there is a really interesting bit in here where she talks a lot about uh, Lolita as in fact anti um, paedophilia um, and and thinks and she sort of posits that it's been misinterpreted whereas actually it it, it looks back on a very sort of damaged character it's, as an almost cautionary tale which I found really, really interesting because I know it has um, a lot of sort of negative thought around it as though it's sort of glorifying the relationship that happens in that book. Um, as I say, this book is um, sparsely told but is all stronger for that because actually, um, and it's her debut um, book as well. Um, the author now works in publishing, which I find quite interesting how she sort of gravitated towards that. Um, but it, 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 it almost makes it the more brutal, but without being, feeling consciously so as though we're being led to what to think. She simply presents us with the what happened and in this sort of spare, sparse prose, which, you know, could also be a thing of translation because, you know, things do get lost and gained in translation. Um, there is a note from the translator at the back. Um, it really allows us to appreciate the starkness of what happened without the sort of complication of, you know, flowery purple prose that is often used to disguise what's truly happening. So this is really gripping and I read it in about a day. It's, you can do that, so that's good. Finally, uh, this is quite an unusual one in some respects and I picked this up completely on a whim. Uh, this is by uh, Deirdre Bear and is called Parisian Lives, Samuel Beckett, Simone de Beauvoir and Me. And this is a memoir of, um, which was also a Pulit, Pulitzer or Pulitzer or whatever uh, prize finalist when it was published which was in uh, 2019 I believe but this edition was in the UK 2020 and this is actually it's quite meta this is Deirdre Bear's story of writing the story of both Samuel Beckett and Simone de Beauvoir and what actually emerges is a story not only about those two people because you can buy the biographies she wrote separately um, as, as additional publications, but this is about her writing about writers, so how her sort of life intersected with theirs and how the biographer's art is um, mired up in the lives of the people they're writing about. You know, there is a famous quote, and I can't for the life of me remember who said it, but um, that basically says that, you know, um, when you write about someone else, you can't help but reveal yourself. So a biography about someone is also a biography about the person who's writing the book, you know, so it's about, you know, which kind of raises questions of what is objective and subjective truth and what is known for certain. But actually that's nice because I quite enjoy that, the idea of how stories get moved, translated, added to, and, you know, moulded by the circumstances in which they happen because, you know, the world, world events don't happen in a vacuum, personal events don't happen in a vacuum, they're very much products of the culture and also individual perception. So I was interested in this mostly because um, obviously on my MA I read Simone de Beauvoir, The Second Sex, I'm very interested in feminist and queer thought, and I, as an actor and a teacher of acting, I'm interested in Samuel Beckett as a playwright. Um, so, but I didn't know a lot about either of them in terms of what kind of people they actually were. And I wondered if that was important. Do we need to know, I just have a sip of tea. Do we need to know who the people are whose work we consume? Perhaps we do. 
perhaps we do, or perhaps that gives us additional insight, or perhaps it muddies the waters, I don't know, but I don't mind not knowing, if that makes sense. I'm actually quite interested in that sort of liminal space of the knowing and not knowing. Sorry, my phone charge just fell on the floor there. Attention seeker. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is well written. This is a slower one um, than the other two in terms of how it moves, but that's okay because it feels like a much more meditative record. Um, so I've read this, I'm still not finished actually by the way, you see I'm only there, um, and we're still on Beckett, but what's interesting is how it's, this format allows it to be meditative and also to, to skillfully blend those two plot lines of the personal and the professional life of the biographer in question, uh, Deirdre Bear. And um, it's also an interesting, again, historical document in terms of how women biographers were treated, how the academy or academics thought about biography and what was important or what wasn't and how difficult it was to make this project happen you know art takes time like I think seven years for the Beckett biography to come out and and all the things that that implies so if you are interested in either of these two people I would absolutely recommend this or if you're just interested in how people write biography and interpret <coughs> excuse me the lives of others then it's definitely um, an intriguing read um, I'll, I'll probably let you know how I get on when I've finished it, but so far I'm enjoying it, I'll be at a slow pace. Okay, so that is it for this week's reading vlog. Um, thank you for joining me, uh, and I hope you found something of interest there, even if they're not particularly to your tastes. You may have just enjoyed my Disney Princess t-shirt. Um, so that is it, the library is now closed, so put those library cards somewhere safe and go out and enjoy the sunshine if and where you can. I'm going to have a short break next week or a short hiatus only because I'm reading a massive chunkster at the moment that I want to talk about. Look at this, it's massive um, and it's about over a thousand pages so I really want to focus in on that. The eighth laugh, spoiled it now. Um, so I will have a week off and then I'll be back in the library to do a deep dive into this. Um, I may do some tag videos in the meantime but if not, don't hate me, um, I'm just juggling, juggling a lot. I could be a gif. <laughs> um, so do stand off in the comments as per usual. Give this a like or subscribe to my channel if you haven't or don't. That's entirely up to you. But in the meantime, take care of yourselves. Much love and be safe. Mwah. Hashtag booksniff.